Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation, this time with special guest Anthony Botard. Mr. Anthony Botard runs Ayers Creek Farm, a 144-acre spread near Gaston, Oregon, where he and his wife Carol specialize in breeding specialty plants, including a very, very purple sort of corn, winter melons, and many, many more. He is also the author of many articles online, as well as the book Beautiful Corn, which I highly recommend. And we're excited to have him today. It's a pleasure to meet you, good sir. How are you? You too. I'm doing well. Doing well. I'm glad to hear Cold it. Cold and damp out. There. I've wondered about that. Um, the with your local conditions, um, I'm really excited about that winter melon you sent me. And I was wondering, like, how long your growing season is? I get about a hundred days here. Do you think that that's too oh, short? Good. No, you're doing well with that. Okay. So we plant them in, we, we, we plant the starts out in June. I usually try to do about 10 days. I don't want them to get pot bound. I don't want them to grow into, um, get into a ball. Sure. So as soon as they're up uh, and, and they have the first true leaf, they go out. And okay. so we look at the long range forecast and, and we, we don't want a frost coming up. So, you know, early June, we can have a frost all the way through Memorial day. And, um, and then they grow pretty quickly, and we harvest them about mid-September. Okay, so and they, then they go on, a metro, and then store them on a metro rack, um, and they just sit there. Once once they ripened, they just hang around. They're very happy. Yeah, and if you look at the way we do this it, along the Silk Road, that's where I, I, I there was a there was a woman who had a a web a, a blog called Big Picture Agriculture. Um, Kay McDonald. It was a great thing. And then she went off and wanted to do knitting or something. Lord knows. But she, she had a great blog for a while. And, and she had one, one day where all these pictures from around the world, and you would look at all these pictures. And so I went in and I clicked in on, and she had some from um, Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan and Pakistan and that whole Silk Road, top of the world, um, I always call it the top of the world because it's so high altitude. And, and, and they grow the melons there, everything, watermelons, um, these hard rind melons. They grow other melons that you have to eat right away, but the, the, the storage melons are the ones they really enjoy growing. And then they hang them in macrame. It's really beautiful and elaborate. They, they have these macrame things and they're hanging down like stalactites in these barns. That's the original so way. Cool. And now they put them on racks. That's finally. And I looked at it and I. No purpose for macrame. It provides yeah. a lot of stuff. So, I want to grow melons like that. So we started and I just, I, I, I remembered we had grown a melon called um, Ver. I can't remember. But anyway, it was a hard skin melon that was grown by Thomas Jefferson and everything. And it would last fairly long in storage. So we just started pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Um, and the seed companies aren't going to do it. Most farmers won't do it because you got to start with 100 melons. And then you got to sit there and stare at them while they sit on those metro racks and rot. <laughs> and the ones that don't rot, the three or four, 10 that don't rot, that's your seed. Yeah. And then you go back and you do the same thing the next year. But that second year, we, we had many more that didn't rot. And those we brought to a restaurant and we said, okay, guys, you have to taste these. And if you like them, give me the seed back. Um, it's free. I didn't charge them anything. I, I, they just, and so they had about 100, 113 million. I can't remember now. And they sent back 13, six, which they said outstanding on. So that's where I started for the next phase is, you know, the flavor, because there's a range of flavors that, that, that you have in any fruit. And so I didn't want something that was watery. I didn't want something that sort of was dull. Um, and then we've also now selected. And then after that, they've started to buy them and I sell them in the stores and stuff. And um, so that one just, uh, that was part of our seed stock that accidentally got put into your box. I'm glad it didn't rot and make a mess of everything. I am grateful me. you sent it. Um, opening that thing with the February snow, I guess it's still technically January right now, but 
with snow all over the ground. We've got about two feet right now and eating a fresh melon is just a bizarre yeah. experience. It's fantastic. My kids thought it was the most delightful thing. Not 20 minutes ago when we opened it up. Yeah, so early on, we, I have, actually have a, a wonderful picture of our granddaughter eating them outside in the snow. Yep, there you are. And, uh, and they, so the that, restaurant staff did a great job with the flavor. Yep. Yeah. And so, we, we, you know, that's, that's sort of part of our retinue now of, of crops. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's where I say, you know, you can, you can call something, you know, you mentioned heirlooms. You call something heirloom or precious, but it is sort of like calling a, a dog an heirloom. They just are not, dogs are not heirlooms. They, they change, they, they, they have genetic changes. Every living organism changes. We're seeing that with, you know, with now underscored with the virus. But, you know, you can expect that. You can expect that with corn. And this is where farmers, an observant farmer, is probably the best uh, warden of their of, of 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 a variety because they go and say, "Yeah, I want that thing to last a whole long time." Or, in our in the case of the cayennes we grow, um, I have this conceit uh, that they are they have the heat of a poet, not a soldier, and that 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 it is an amiable heat, and and food needs amiable heat. Now, there's all sorts of people who want violent, hot, you know, they'll send spears up through your palate. Um, this, this just hits you right about here. And you can feel, you know, after you've eaten, you're just a little bit of warmth around the neck. And, uh, and, and it sort of lingers nicely in the palate. And it never, never assaults you. It, 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 it works with the food, not against it. Yeah. It's a part with you the food. You can still taste the rest of yeah, I'm meal. not looking for the one where the guy goes, um, and he goes, you know, eats 42 of them and wins a prize yeah. um, a night in Las Vegas or something. <laughs> With uh, an atonement thereafter, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No, no palate left, no, no taste buds. <laughs> you know, with the, that, that, uh, you called it a ward, that, that you get to be a warden of that, of that heritage. And it's a really interesting place that you're in because it's not just that you're a warden preserving stalwartly everything that came before, but you get to influence the future by your own experience. I mean, you pick the flavors you like. Uh, I remember watching a video that um, you were in where you were breeding a, a purple corn just because it would be purple and that would be awesome. I, I mean, you get to choose these values that you... Uh, that's a, you you can't see it it's so black we call it peace noir wow so wow. It, it, it's a joke uh peace noir means a, a black piece a black thing uh, but but peace noir uh, it's peace p e a c e no awesome. war so it's a it's a, it's an old slogan from the 60s which i grew up with the 70s 60s and 70s so I just keep working on this to make it blacker and blacker and blacker. And, and here, here's another one. This one's really dark. You can see wow, this. Wow, look at the husks. And the silk is, is, uh, is, is black and purple as well. So these are anthocyanin pigments. And if you, I, 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 I'm not going to do it right now, but if you scratch that kernel, it will be absolutely snowy white inside. Really? So, it's just that out so It's a flower corn. Yeah, it's a flower corn, very light flower corn. And then inside, you, you have the, the starch, the white starch. Virtually no protein. There's a tinge of bitterness to the anthocyanins because they're the same pigments you get in wine. They're water-soluble. Okay. And so you can play with them. You can, you can, you can, you, depending upon the pH, you can shift them towards pink, purple, or with a um, with a, a base with alkaline base, so with um, a slack lime for making um, nixtamal, you can shift them all the way the other way, just absolutely as black as they are here. And so you have you, you, you know it's it's kind of fun to it, to experiment with it, um, and 
I always wanted to, I, I've always, no, I've tried it and alas, it doesn't work. I've tried to mix it with uh, the yellow corn in order to get a green corn for St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'll try again this year because St. Patrick's Day is not here yet. <laughs> and I'll keep trying that. But, uh, you know, that's, that's one of those little challenges. And then last year, so we've been growing this and selecting it for this type for 10 years. We've been, you know, dogged about it. My staff and I would go out there and look. I want a fairly thin um, ear, too. I don't want a big fat ear because we, we, we hand shell it. And it has to fit through the sheller. Oh, what an interesting uh, so, select, selection thing to select for. So, so he has, you know, this equipment. is a flint horn. And once again, so it's really tight. So it goes through the sheller. So there are eight rows and you can just whip through. But if you had a big, huge butt on it, um, which you can get with certain types of corn, um, that just destroys your shoulder. And after a couple of years, I said, oh, I got to start selecting for, for going through a corn sheller. And, and, and harvesting by hand. But one of the advantages of harvesting by hand is last year we came up with this ear and it, it, I don't know if you can see it. it, it it's, it's a throwback from 10 years ago, a, a type that I had in, in the book as one of those, I said, well, this is one road we could go down. This is the other road. So we decided to go down a really purple road and this thing shows up. So next year I'm gonna pull off these kernels and plant them and just see what this road looks like. I'll have the purple in another part of the farm, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, it, it's fascinating to me that 10 years later, this odd robin shell pattern shows up in the field out of nowhere. And and uh, so that, that will be planted next year, just as a lark. Um, yeah. That's what farmers can do. You go, hmm, I don't know why that's there or, what you know, we did that with. Um, we're doing it with the chicories this year. We have, uh, you know, we're in. We, we're working on new chicory. Those beautiful actually. red chicories from the Po Valley. What? Those beautiful red chicories from the article that you wrote. The ones that they grow yeah. in Italy. But that's the old one. This one's going to be a more robust one with largely white, but some red. It's sort of more like the Italian um, uh, um, Castle Franco type. Okay. Looks like a Castle Franco, but it's because it's, it's heading up at this time of year in, in, at the end of February, early March, it is heading up at a time when it's getting ready to put on its flowers. And so the, it is mobilizing the sugars and the amino acids from the root up and then it forms this big dense uh, cabbage like head. And then out from that comes the flower bud. And I think I had it in the calendar as well. You got a copy of the calendar. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, so, so we, we've been working with that. And once again, that's uh, you know, a farmer going out in the field and saying, "Hmm, you know, what's this doing here? Oh, I think I want this odd variant. Yeah, um, it's worth you know playing with. You know, some work, some don't. I love that but phrase. To say playing with. That's what? a beautiful thing. I mean, you're not just chasing pure yields uh, and you're not just chasing pure flavor. You're also playing with with the varieties that you choose and the, the things that you want to do. I mean, it's almost is like a farm is a big sandbox. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you always want to, you always, if, if you can there, it's harder with field crops. Um, it's easier with some, with crops that sort of fit in the hand. Um, so it, it would be relatively hard to go out with my Durham wheat and look at every head and, you know, I could do that. And, and long ago, farmers did that. But uh, at, at this point, it's a little daunting. And then you've got to like what you're growing because I like onions uh, as a vegetable. Growing them... Yeah, we grow we grow onions. I like really big white onions, huge as as big as I can get, because I, I just like the flavor of white onions. I, I, I'm a white onion person for some reason. Um, it, it, my mother would have frowned on it. I know a lot of people would have said, "Oh, you should have red or yellow." You know, those white things are just they don't have any nutrients or something. I don't know what the hell my mother would say, but um, it's similar to that. 
and and she didn't like Frank Sinatra either, and I love Frank Sinatra. So, um, you know, I, I lived with that burden. Um, but it, 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 so I don't breed onions. I don't go out and say, "Wow, I'm going to go." Out and, wow, that's a really neat onion. But some people would, you know, there are people who love garlic. They love growing garlic. But in my case, the corn, the tomatoes. I like uh, I like a really good tomato sauce. Uh, the melons, um, something it just it just grabs the side of the side of your eye, and you go, "Oh, I gotta have that." It's it's not it's not front on. It's not I'm planning to do this. Like yeah. huh. You know? And we did yeah. that with we grow mustard seed. And I don't know why I grew mustard seed. But then I realized in the case of the mustard, it's not genetics, but it is the climate it's grown in. So almost all of the mustard is grown up in Saskatchewan. Oh, like Saskatchewan and India, but virtually all of the Western mustard is, it goes into every jar of, of fancy Dijon mustard that you get from France. Probably came from the Saskatchewan. And, and, and so they do not have locally grown mustard. They buy the mustard and they have a local process. Dijon just means it's made with wine. And reading Shakespeare, um, Falstaff talks about um, humor being as thick as mustard, and he's and he's he, he's it's, it's just he, it's an outburst, a, a thick as Tewksbury mustard, and Tewksbury is a, a town I, I visited as a child when I when I when my friend and I went and we got a British rail pass and we went all over England. My mother just dropped us off in the airport with British rail pass and said, "Oh, here's you know, buy yourself a sleeping bag and a tent." And we were just left to roam around England. I, 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 today, I think about it and I go, this is a very strange thing for my mother to do. But I had a friend and we went and we spent three weeks um, a, a, on a British rail pass, just going from town to town. And Tewksbury was one of them. And it's, where they, it's at the confluence of the Severn and the Avon Rivers. And it's this... Climate just like ours. We're at Willamette and the um, and the Columbia River, uh, and it's moist. It's it's influenced by the uh, by the Irish Sea and stuff, so it has the same climate. And I realized when I started growing it, if you soak it, it becomes so thick that you, if you dump it out onto a bowl onto a plate, you can take a knife, and slice through it, and move it, and it won't collapse. And it's it's the um, it's the emulsifiers in it, and they're dense, and so it's Shakespeare's quote comes back to me. You go, yeah, dense is Tewksbury mustard, and 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 it, and then I started researching Tewksbury mustard. It was famous for the quality, and they used to mix it with horseradish and stuff, and and they actually used to mix it and and dry it into these balls, and then you'd shape it onto things. Um, but it's that emulsifying effect. And you know, I have a lot of people, including my grandchildren. Now we send them mustard from here, and they love it because we, the, my my daughter and um, our friends cook it. Uh, I mean, take on some um, vinegar and honey, half and half. Get it quite hot. After soaking the mustard for a couple of days, they dump it into the hot mix, stir it around, and throw it in the fridge. And then you just put on tablespoons and tablespoons of this on salad dressings, on in soups, wherever you want. On, on 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 wieners, you know, you just pile it up on the wiener, and and and, and it's actually more satisfying than the ground prepared mustard. Much more interesting, and it's got a little crunch because you're chewing into those little um, those little mustard seeds. But that's so that's a climate thing. Um, yeah, climate's more really the culture important. than the genetics. Yeah, and it's because we have a a cold winter, and I can look out now, and I'm looking at the mustard. The mustard's maybe two feet high, it's going to be flowering in about yeah, a month and a half. And so it's sending its roots down deep into the soil and, and it's growing really slowly. And then it will flower and most of its seed production will be finished um, before our soils dry out. So it's a dry land crop, but, it, it, but, it, it, but the roots are down there pulling up the moisture and nutrients and building the mustard seed. It just builds a better mustard seed. I wouldn't have, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, 
you know, would you, you know, please grow mustard seed for me in the Willamette Valley because it's going to be really good. I would have said, oh, that's a pain. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, what are you talking about? But it, you know, kind of stumbled into it. And yeah. part of the story is also these two nuns. And I heard them interviewed on NPR and some show. It wasn't Terry Gross, but it was, it was some, you know, it may have been the BBC. And I heard them being interviewed and they talked about, oh, you know, we, we, in preparing our mustard, we always soak it um, for a couple of days. We get it just to begin to germinate. And it's a, then it's sweeter and, it's, and it, it has a better flavor. That's when I went and I put all the pieces together. When I heard that, I went, huh. And so I realized that, and then they went, and then the secret is we have this mix of special spices that we're not going to tell you about because it's our secret and, and that's our trademark. And I went, no, you told me a secret already. The secret is biological. The secret is that the mustard seed has started to break down its sugars uh, or break down its starches because it's, it's, it's starch and, and amino acids. And it started to break that down and sweetens the mustard in a subtle way and it starts to make it less hot, less uh, raw violent. in the mouth. Less violent, yeah. And um, and that's what it, it, that's what you need to do with mustard. And that's why you, you get a really good Bavarian mustard. It's really mild. It's not it's not hot. It doesn't destroy. But if you if you um, if you're careless and you think, well, I'm going to make my own mustard, or not careless, but if you think I'm going to make my own mustard because why should I pay for for that little jar of thing that comes from you know, some place in, in Bob area. And then you, you, you do it and you go, this is not very good. It's kind of hot. And I think I'll go back to Bob area. <laughs> That's awesome. It's so interesting that th there are those differences. So as you're cultivating uh, a plant for a particular attribute, some of those, uh, some of those attributes are in the genetics and you have to select for them and others are in the cultivation and the climate and the, the locality. And it's, it, it seems like that would be really difficult to disentangle what causes what, and it would require you to pay really close attention. Um, I remember reading your article about the pumpkin seeds and learning that uh, you needed to actually harvest the seeds out of the pumpkins several months after you picked the pumpkins in order to affect the flavor. Uh, would you mind telling just a little bit about that? Well, one thing farmers hate to do is lose money. <laughs> so, so that's that's a great inspiration for a lot of stuff. So you go, uh, so pumpkin seeds, we, we grew pumpkin seeds for a couple of years. Oh, this is really going well. We can sell them. They was, they'd sell out the first time I offered them. And they were really good. And I didn't really think twice about it. Um, it, it because we would bring them in and we'd have them hanging around for a while and then I had time. Then my staff came with the idea that we're going to go out and we're going to do this professionally. And Antonio doesn't know what he's doing. You know, he's he's uh, he's he's doddering out, you know, in in the harvest shed, and 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 they did everything outside really fast. And the and the seeds started to ferment, and even those that didn't ferment just didn't taste good. It kind of tasted like vomit, and I realized, you know. Oh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave them lying around again, and and I had to actually tell them this year. I said, "Don't!" They started opening them. I said, "No, no, no, don't, don't, don't!" I've already figured this out, and 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 so I gave them a taste of ones that had that they had just harvested and opened up, and then the ones that I had um, from the year before, and they understood it they immediately. Um, you got you know it's it's important to have a good staff. That you can talk to, or and and a good mate. I mean, my my partner in this, Carol. You know, we're always we're scrapping all the time about this, that, and the other, because you you gotta have an opinion. When I was at the market, we would give samples to to people, and they and it's you know, I said, well, what do you think? And they go, eh, it's not bad. I go, well, that's not. It. <laughs> I said, and I tell kids, you gotta have an opinion. You gotta tell me, do you like this or do you not like it? Don't shrug your shoulders. I said, if you don't like it, you can spit it out in the garbage. If you really like it, um, I'll be happy. And then if I'm happy, I give them a whole pint. 
um, <laughs> because they come back, you know, and next week their parents are back. Hey, you know, little Johnny liked that or little Tanya loved that, loved those berries. So she said I had to buy a whole flat and she promised to eat them all. I go, yeah, she's going to eat them all because she has an opinion about them. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's uh, and so with the pumpkin seed, and then the other thing was, you know, we were we are also looking at other factors, dark dark seeds because they tend to have more oil in them. Mm. It's just like the cayennes; we go for the very dark fruits because they they tend to be kinder. Um, the lighter red fruits tend to be hotter and not as gentle, um, and so you you know you just have to start playing and tasting, and you have to trust your palate. Or trust somebody else's palate, and, um, and 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 do the research. I love you know bumping through. I you know I, I read um, the New York Times Wednesday section on food every week. I read the whole thing cover to cover um, because you get some interesting nuggets from them, and uh, you know it, it also you get to see you know last year suddenly a whole bunch of people were doing pumpkin seeds. Um, we've been sort of bumping along for 10 years. And then Cayenne's also have started to come into, um, into uh, popularity. Um, so we just, I watch it, um, uh, you know, not interested in, in publicity per se, but, you know, I just like to, I do like to know what other people are doing. Yeah. We have a very good market here and I sell everything. So even this last year, which was a little, um, sometimes nail biting, but you know, we, we, we pass through good shape. So. I'm so glad somebody made it through 2020. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, <laughs> we have 2021, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it has, as you can imagine, a brighter moment for most of us. <laughs> yeah. That's a wonderful it's thing. I, I think that kind of research that you mentioned with the New York times is a really interesting way to, uh, there's a couple of types of research. Some research is to dive down a rabbit hole you already know is there. And then a lot of what you're doing seems to be trying to discover things that you've never heard of before to find where the new rabbit holes are. And for that, something like reading the food section of the New York Times every week is a really good way to find, like you said, those nuggets that are going to uh, give you an indication or that NPR article about sprouting the mustard seed where you say, oh, I didn't know that was a thing, but now that I know that's a thing, I can play with that. Yeah, well, it's like the um, with our potatoes. Um, you, it, it, hearing that somebody's paying one hundred and fifty dollars a kilo for potatoes or whatever the hell it is, I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head. And it's because they're grown in seaweed, and we've been doing that for years in the kelp. Um, and I had done I, as a, in a in a in a um, term paper for. Plants and Human Affairs, Biology 104, which I took as a, as, a, as a sophomore or junior, I think it was a sophomore in college, um, I had done an article on, on kelp and, and, and seaweeds of New England, because I was living in New England at the time, and that was my term paper. And, and I had read about how in Nova Scotia, they had piled up kelp, and they, and they make these deep kelp beds. And then they leave them for a year, and let them start to break down and rot more than it, 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 potatoes don't mind the salt. A lot of plants like salt. Um, and we don't have enough salt or sodium in our soils here, so we go through tons of salt every. We go through a, about a ton, ton and a half of salt every year, and and we've used about forty tons of salt on our farm uh, over the years. Um, so it's it's one of those things. You know, I I, I knew that there was something that because you buy potatoes in the store. And that's boring. It's, you might as well be, you know, just reconstituting paper sometimes. Um, but if you grow, grow up potato and kelp and bone meal and, and get some uh, rock dust, azomite, the flavor just is, 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 is and, and you know it because you can take, there's an old recipe, which is you take a couple of potatoes, you dice them up, a little bit of salt, put them in water, Boil the water, strain off the water, throw away the potatoes, and drink the potato water. The potato stock. And if you have a good potato, potato stock is like this. If you're tired and you really, you know, you're cold and it's the end of the day, 
you don't want to, you're not looking to fill up. You're looking to have something really nourishing. Potato water is it, but you can't make potato water from store-bought potatoes. Interesting. And, and from my perspective, everybody talks about potato varieties. We just, we just grow a whole bunch. Throw, uh, 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 we, get, we just buy a whole bunch of different ones. Throw them all in the ground. We don't really keep them separate. And when we, when it, I do sell some, and we sell them at you know three fifty a pound, in, and 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 it's not really, I'm not breaking even even on that. So we sell them, and uh, and and people buy a five pound bag. They don't have any choice about it. Um, they pay you know nineteen dollars for a five pound bag, and that's you know that's it. Um, and I'll throw some beans in. We throw some red potatoes, white potatoes, little potatoes, yellow flesh, white flesh, it, the whole mix. And that is actually makes for a really nice mashed potato. Or this idea that you're going to have one type of potato. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I think it's a very narrow way of thinking. And, and, and I prefer to have a little diversity. That's true with, um, we did that with the barley. We just mixed up the barley, you know. We were all these single types of barley, and I realized barley um, begins with being can be boring, um, but it's more interesting if you mix up the types because they all have subtly different flavors. And um, it's like a meritage in wine or a blended whiskey. Uh, you know, a, a, an adept blender of whiskey. Um, can, I can't drink whiskey anymore, but. Um, when I used to, it, you know, there's great flavor in having the mixture of, of different types and single malt. I never liked as much, but that's that's a you know I'm sure there'd be a whole bunch of people who come after me on that one. <laughs> the purists, I'm sure, prefer the pure beverage. But that's so interesting that, that I've seen bags like that. Like I did a, a carrot mix a few years ago in the garden. That was the white carrots and the yellow ones and the orange ones and the, the purple ones all together. And I, I don't know, I never ate them all together like as a mashed potato, but just the treasure hunt when it came time to harvest made it completely worth it. That surprise, that that delight, yeah, pulling out the carrot and saying, what color is this one going to be? I don't know. That was a lot of fun, especially with the kids. With, with the potatoes, I mean, you sell some, but mostly those are for your own table. Are there other crops like that that you just grow for home use? Yeah, a lot of Asian greens, um, uh, bok choy. And, and uh, so it, 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 within the farming community, I've always tried to avoid stepping on my fellow farmers' toes. So there are people who grow a lot of lettuce. They grow, um, uh, you know... Uh, uh, certain uh, Asian greens, and that's a specialty. And I can come in and throw them into the market mix and then disappear, um, it, you know, at a restaurant or something. But it's never comfortable. And I always, I've always found it, um, uh, root celery, knob celery is the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with how I grow it. And I I, with the celery, we always use a lot of salt on it. The flavor is, I think, better. But I, I'm very, it's a diplomatic thing with other farms. And so it's not really fixing the market or anything, but it's, it's saying you have high tunnels, you're going to be growing certain things. We grow sauce tomatoes, sauce tomatoes only. I don't grow other tomatoes. I don't care about other tomatoes. We grow, you know, in and uh, we grow the late, late chicory. So the farms that have, you know, buy Italian seed and they get a range all the way through the year of chicories. But I'll, you know, I, I just, I avoid competing or stepping on toes of people that I like, you know, fellow <laughs> <So, Yeah>. <laughs> farmers. And There's plenty of niches. It's easy enough to find your own, especially when you like new crops anyway. Yeah. And you can and, find the uh, eclectic thing and be the, the standout booth at the farmer's market. Yeah, and we'd stopped, we stopped going to the farmer's market about uh, now seven years ago, mainly because what disappointed me about the farmer's market is that we haven't seen it evolve in this country. 
it, you're still having to go in with your tent, with your, you know, um, tables. And I try to get our farmer's market to build a more permanent site because I, I looked at my band and I said, you know, or our band, a third of our band was filled up with non-cash items, i.e. tables, tent, um, you know, risers to put things on. And I say, you know, I'd really love it if we started discussing having some sort of structure so I, we could come in and not have to. Um, and, I, you know, I ran into resistance from the farmers who immediately said, well, you know, your ideas are going to mean that we're going to have to pay more per week. I said, well, you're paying 40 bucks a week. I said, you know, most of us were, you know, our gross was about four to $6,000 a week. I said, our, our stall fee is nothing. Yeah. I said, if you can't, if, if, if you're not making enough, you know, and that's my philosophy about farming. If you're not making enough to pay, we pay fourteen fifty an hour. And if I can't, and we'll be $15 this year because I want to stick with the national minimum and I think it's going to be 15. If you can't afford to pay that, um, you have no business being in farming I, as a, you know, and in our case, we provide housing as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in good shape with our staff. And so, I mean, that's been the challenge this year is losing staff because of the, of the virus. And a lot of them want to go back to Mexico because they are, they're frightened and they have the health care there that they don't have here. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, it, it's, a, it's an odd thing, but it, it, it maybe it's just being able to hear people talk in Spanish it is his own, you know, healing. But, yeah. the, uh, but anyway, that, that, I don't need to get into digression about uh, labor, but it's, uh, it is, um, anyway, I, I'll leave it. No, that, that's actually a very interesting topic because if you're if you're paying for, I mean, just on the economic side, running the business, if you're paying for the labor to set up all the booths and the risers and everything else, um, you're over forty bucks probably by the time you're set up and ready to go with the farmers market to begin with, and then you have thirty percent less uh, stock to sell, get, given how much of mm -hmm. the space went into your van, and so that, that's a really interesting thing. I wonder, um, you, you've done a fair amount of traveling in Europe where the idea of a farmer's market is quite a bit more normal, where a market day once a week is a very common thing. Um, I never paid enough attention when I lived in Holland to, to really see how that worked economically, but is it different there? Um, is that something that you know about? Um, some, are, some are permanent, so you have your permanent space. So, so the markets in Europe are different than our markets. The vendors there are not the farmers themselves. And, and so you will find that you will, you will have permanent markets that have a market hall and you go in and you walk around and you buy from different vendors. The vendor is, is a small business person, but not the farmer itself. But they're the person with the connection to the farmers. So it already starts on a, 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 with a different premise than us and, and the U.S. farmers markets, which theoretically and doesn't happen in every venue, but in the case in Portland, for most of the markets, it was a matter of you had to grow it, and there was some there was some uh, grace on for some people. You know, you could you could bring in sweet corn if nobody else had sweet corn. Um, so they had the, the full selection of the market. There were all these equivocations, but it, it, it was a matter of um, the, the, the grower sells what they grow. Okay. And, um, and, 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 you know, it was, it was not a perfect thing, but that's what our, that's a, the premise that our, our farmers markets are based on. The Where market, the, the key thing seems to be authenticity. They, yeah. they want a direct connection from consumer to farmer. Right where the European model is, as you're describing, it sounds a little bit more like a hybrid, um, a yeah. hybrid grocery store with a slightly closer connection. Yeah. So it rather, yeah, rather than being a grocery store, it's a, um, there's a whole bunch of vendors who have their own connections to farmers and, and you look around and you start to know the vendor you want to deal with. Um, and, 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 and 
in some respects, as farmers markets have grown, that's how it's evolved in this country too. That the, the, the people who are sitting there at the market, in our case, we were always at the market. To me, I'm a thespian. I love the, the drama. I love the theater of the farmer's market. So, um, and, and I like the theater of going into a, a restaurant. I miss that this year because you can't, you couldn't be quite as freewheeling and, and easygoing. Um, but even still, I, I figure out a way to do it. Um, there's there's a touch of the thespian in me, and and so I like the the theater. Some farmers don't. They go, oh, I would never stand out in a farmer's market. I go, the world's a stage. The farmer's market Bring is. It on. You got you got you got the whole audience. You know, I remember I remember in college, people go, well, oh, class, and I go, no, 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 you got it all wrong. It's a performance, and if you have if you have a great professor. They're as good as Richard Burton or uh, Lawrence Olivier. They should be able to hold your attention all the way through that class. If they can't do it, you know what? I mean, who, who are they? And um, my the, my favorite professors could do that. I mean, they could they could just they they would you would you would come out and you go, wow, that was great. That was a great lecture. And and, and that's theater. Yeah. And and, and uh, otherwise. I don't know. I always see, I just always see things in theatrical terms, but. Um, yeah. And I, even I, that is an example of that uh, optimizing for more than one thing that comes out again in, in your plant breeding. It's that I'm not just interested in how fast you can get the information from your head into my head. I want the experience of it as well. And so we're, we're considering multiple values at the same time and trying to get them all to, to, to jive together. That's a really I, cool thing. And, and if, you can, if you can get a story, you yeah. know, we, 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 you know, it, that's always fun. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you can get um, full staff to endorse your mustard, you know, I, I Sir John, thank you. <laughs> but it, that uh, it, it's, it's a, a kind of a loopy way to go about it. But that's I think some bad. of my fellow farmers are far too serious. I mean, I just, I, uh, I always love the, uh, I love the songs of uh, Stephen Sondheim because they can be very, very funny. And, uh, and I call him Uncle Stephen because if I had an uncle, I'd want it to be Stephen Sondheim. But, it, you know, there's a great, in the beginning of the, uh, beginning of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum is, you know, this, this is, a, this is a stage play. You know, you're gonna have fun. This is, you know, this is the beginning of the, uh, uh, you know, a a a, uh, a a fun moment. I'm not, they, you know, he was. They weren't trying to recreate Rome. They were just gonna have fun. Put Buster Keaton and and uh, Zero Mostel together, and a few other good actors. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's I have it. It sounds like a thing I need to see, though. A funny yeah, thing yeah. on the way to the forum. Yeah, and, and, and Stephen Sondheim, I think Sondheim's, the thing about Sondheim is his his flops sometimes are better. The, the music that comes from his flops sometimes <laughs> better than, than his successes. Um, Anyone Can Whistle, which was a flop by any measure, but there are three great songs in it. Um, one is Anyone Can Whistle. I mean, it's such a sweet, endearing song. Uh, but don't get me off on Stephen Sondheim, but it's... That's a remarkable thing. I love that uh, in your articles online that you've written for, uh, I can't remember the name of that blog, Something Northwest. Yeah, Good Stuff Northwest. Good Stuff Northwest. Uh, it's a good title for the for the blog. Um, there, There is, you pull from music, talking about uh, different varieties of a crop as variations on a theme relating that to classical music. Um, there's just a, there's just a breadth, and I think that small farming done right should call for that kind of breadth, and should allow enough time for that kind of breadth, so that the farming is, you know, blessed by the knowledge of a lot of different things about milling and about, you know, the manufacturing, about the distribution process, and about the economics and all that stuff, and also the art and the flavor and how it's used in cooking, and also the purely random stuff that's just for personal curiosity. And I, I really I get that like from that. my father. Actually, it's not a day I goes. I get that from my father, who was he. 
he he went to school in England. He was he was raised in Denmark and grade school in Denmark, and then went to England to get a, a horticultural degree from the Royal Horticultural Society Gardens. And then he he started a a uh, market farm, and he would bring in his. This was actually during the Blitz, and he would drive into um, into London to um, uh, Covent Garden, and he would bring in his cabbages and. He, he was pretty boring stuff, actually. You know, I always said it was pretty boring what he grew car carrots and stuff, and he would bring them in. But, you know, as he said, you, you know, you were actually driving around bomb craters. <laughs> and, and then I remember driving with him several years later, and, 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 and he was driving and it was on the other side of the road, and he, he had lost his touch. And I said, Cecil, I got to take over the wheel. No, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I I drove through London in the Blitz. And I said, yeah, but you're making your own personal Blitz at the moment. Women in perambulus and you know, <laughs> people with their dogs racing off to the side cars. Going. I said, let, 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 just give me the steering wheel. And it's really hard to drive on the other side of the road. Um, you have to drive slowly and concentrate very hard. But you know, he always liked to look around. But um he, um, you know, he would, he, all the fine little details about dealing with the East End farmers, you know, talking about how horseradish, horseradish started out as meerradish, which is the German sea radish. And it's a wonderful, wonderful word, the original German and Dutch. Um, so we lo the low countries, it came from the low countries. And, and, and of course the English, you know, vendors went, you know, oh, this, I mean, meerradish, it's, Mir, I mean, it's only Reddit. And so they said, we got to find a stronger reference. And they actually changed the name to horseradish because horse is strong. A mare is yeah. weak. Mare is a female horse. And it's funny how you know, he knew that. He, he told me that, you know, it's like that story always stuck in my head. And then he said, you could always tell um, when, when, when the farmers brought in their goods, the, 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 uh, the, the buyers would watch the crows. And it was because the crows, if they saw grubs on the cabbage or whatever, the crows would be on it. And so the crows would come down and, and, and then immediately, immediately the buyer would be on the alert because the crows knew what, you know, what loads had grubs and interesting stuff in. Yeah. And um, so. It was like Odin and following the ravens. Yeah. That's awesome. So that was, you know, one of his little, you know, there were all these little stories that he told. And um, and then eventually he, he went into ornamentals. So I grew up around ornamentals, not farming, but um, same respect for, for food. And yeah, and for, for breadth. I really, really like the, I, I, I think that the, the joys of gardening are underappreciated. It's something that I've just been getting into the last couple of years. Um, I, gosh, when did I read your book? I think it was last year, Beautiful Corn, which I'm going to leave a link for down below. This is this is fantastic. Um, but not not just corn, but corn's a good example that you can customize it over time. And if you're paying attention, then you learn about the habits of the birds, and you learn about the habits of the insects, and you learn about the weather, and you learn about the the seasons. And I mean it just puts you way more in tune with things going on outside. And it's, it's kind of a focus point that then spreads your interest out in all directions. Yeah. It's a pretty, maybe a pretty liberal education. Yeah. No, I, I you know, I, I, I love nature and I, you know, I, I, and I, I'm fortunate that I never, you know, felt nature was the enemy. So I never, so if there's a, you know, we're always getting new pests. And I mean, even the, the quote unquote murder hornets, I think are pretty damn neat. And when, so when I hear about them, I go, holy smokes, I wonder if we have any here. I mean, I'm like, you know, yeah, they're gonna eat some honeybees. Of course, all the entomologists are university entomologists, they have to raise money. So this is like a godsend to them. A murder hornet, a, a, a miserable, big, huge thing, it's two inches long. You can you can raise all you need from the state legislature because yep. you can say that all the honeybees are going to collapse and they're going to sit around roaming around eating every single honeybee that's in the lower fifty states. It's 
not going to happen. It's not, it's not good. And it's sloppiness that we got it here. And it's our damn fault. But, you know, I've been through the collapse of this, that, and the other. We got the spotted wing Drosophila is going to cause the collapse of the fruit industry. And, you know, this was the pest of all time um, because it, it liked to lay eggs in green fruit. And I went, holy smokes. The female sits here and she's got a little clockwise screw and she's got to go all the way in and drive her, her uh, ovipositor in. And I thought, you know, I can't imagine a spider would sit around and say, hmm, look at that female insect. She's going around and around and around. I'll wait until she lays an egg and then get her. No, if you have enough spiders in your field. I mean, she's, she's, she's really not in a great position out there. In fact, we've had no problem with them. The other um, insect that was going to cause cause a world of woe was the um, marmorated stink bugs, and they're these beautiful. They're, they're beautiful. The marmorated means marbled, and the beautiful carapace on the back, and and then the um, and then the uh, underneath is this lime green, stunning lime green, yellow lime, really? and they're stunning. They're beautiful little insects, and and once again, everybody was they were going to cause the collapse of the fruit industry, and the grape industry, and everything else. I'm sure that somebody will say, oh, I have problems with them. And it, it, but then it's because you're spraying too much. Um, you know, if, if you don't spray and you let the spiders and insects and sparrows, I like sparrows, so we have a lot of sparrows, thousands of sparrows on the property. Um, it's, it's, it, then you'll, you won't have such a problem, you know? Even kestrels, the sparrowhawks will eat them because, you know, they, they, they go after grasshoppers and other things, earthworms. Kestrels don't eat solely mice and, uh, and, and other things. They're actually very, they're handy to have around um, the little sparrowhawk because they, they'll eat worms, they'll eat snakes, they'll, whatever they can get, you know, they're yeah. pretty much generalists. That's really cool. I love that you describe that that beetle, that stink beetle, as as beautiful, and it is. But I don't think that's something that you would notice if you were caught up in the fear mongering. You know. No. And you know, to be able to it, appreciate it, that is a problem. A little bit of a problem here and there. So you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to dismiss it entirely. No. It has a, it has a, a passion for yellow fruit. So um, we tried growing yellow melons, and boy, it, it, it liked those. So we don't grow yellow melons. We grow green melons. It doesn't like green melons. Um, it likes the it likes corn stalk. So it, it, they tend to eat on the, the the sugars coming up the corn stalk. So you can mm. see them. I I think something can still be a problem and still be beautiful. Thinking about tigers and and the like, but you know it's. It is significant that you can see it at the same time. That that idea of not seeing nature as the enemy, but you know, I mean, it is dangerous, but not the enemy. Yeah, that's a really cool thing. Yeah, it's like go. We have gophers, and, and yeah, if we have a gopher in the in the field, you know, we'll trap it. I mean, yeah, I don't have any, you know, compunction about that. But because um, no. they go down a row of potatoes, just like. They'll, they'll go, whoa, look at that. Beans. They like the beans. They like the, the, they'll eat them all. They'll just go, they'll burrow underneath, come up. The same with the chicory. So you got to put a trap out, and that's the end of it. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and you learn about nutrition because a gopher that's out in the grass, grassy duff around us, they're just stupid. They, you could probably trap them if you wanted to in, in a thrice bank. They go into potatoes or sweet potatoes or garlic, chicories, which are highly nutritious plants. And they get them, they, they are, they, they develop this, this intelligence out there. It, you, you put a trap in and it buries it right away. They can smell that you have, they've just become, they become a different creature. And, it's, and I think it's because of nutri nutrition in the food. At least staff and I have this theory and, 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 and Zanon will go, oh, we least though it's all that 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 gopher is really ready you can tell it's always it's always we least though means it's not going to be taken by surprise and, and so you know you go okay so we we have to conspire and think about how we're going to get it plot plot and, and it just requires a, a higher level 
Whereas if it was in a grassy area, you, you, you just drop a trap and hold, and that would be the end of it. That's so interesting. That farming makes you a strategist, a bit of a, a battlefield commander as well. <laughs> yeah. Selectively, but I mean, that's it's interesting that you have to get not only into you know the the ecology, but the psychology of some of these critters. That's what makes it fun. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> If, if you if you just see the see things as enemies and um, things that need to be sprayed against, or I mean, and, and, and organic farmers fall into this too. They but all got their little potions and stuff, and, and and we had that early on. So we grew a lot of blackberries, and early on we were growing for Cascadian Farm. Um, so we were growing about three hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, we were actually. When, when when we first started, when we first bought the farm, they they had the blackberries and we, we they were converted to organic, and we were about fifteen percent of the nation's organic supply of blackberries. I didn't know, you know, this, and um, and 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 so you know things were going, but we had one problem in the field, and that was um, was called a red spot, a red berry mite. And uh, um, what they do is they, they feed at the bottom of the, um, of the uh, droplet in the berry. And so that part, wherever they're feeding, turns red. It won't, it won't ripen. And they keep it from ripening. And I don't know, you know, they, they're probably some, some sort of uh, biochemical interaction. So I was writing to some guy down in Australia had done a lot of, uh, no, uh, New Zealand had done a lot of research on this. And I'm there, you know, in my tale of woe. And he said, we use, you know, um, lime sulfur and we use horticultural oils. And he said, I just, I can't quite get the numbers down. And he said, well, that's your problem. He said, there are plenty of, uh, he said, when I've studied them, there are plenty of predaceous mites. And he said, give it a couple of years. Just stop spraying. And he said, just watch what, will, watch what happens. He said, I think your problem's going to disappear and become a sort of background problem. And he was right. Two years later, they, they disappeared. Wow. And it was I was spraying and I was killing off the predaceous mites. So these, these mites sit there and they bear, burrow themselves deep into the fruit underneath the droplets um, after flowering. And, and they hide down in the duff on the ground and they, and they come up and they immediately go in and set and, and start feeding. And, and in his case, I mean, I, what he said was the predaceous mites are walking around trying to find more of these mites to eat. And they're the, they're, they're the ones you're going to kill. And so when you spray, you're spraying the, the predaceous mites. They're eating all sorts of other pests that are really valuable. And he said, don't just, don't, don't, don't just see the, the, the problem you have. As, as, as one dimensional. He said, your problem is you don't have enough predaceous mites out there. Slack off, stop spraying, and you, you solve your problem. Yeah. And, and I did. I don't have, today, the, 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 the mite, we still have them in the field, maybe 1%, one half of a percent. Yeah. Thing, you know, to, and crows probably eat more, and I like watching the crows eat them. So <laughs> I can only teach the crows to eat the ones with the red cells on. We'd be all set. Yeah, train them. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, it reminds me of that permaculture principle that the problem is the solution. The problem with the mites is that, I mean, the mites are the bait. The mites are the bait for the thing that's going to take care of the mites. Yep. That's really and it's, 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 it's true. I mean, and, but you also get people come up. We have we have barn owls and great horned owl, and we we have um, several different types of hawk that live here. People go, as well as weasels and other things. And the people go, well, you got a lot of predators out there. Um, and I go, yeah, but you got you, the only reason we have a lot of predators is because we got a lot of prey. <laughs> you, you can't have one without the other. And, and so, you know, that's, that's the odd thing about the beneficial, you know, the argument, well, well um, you know, hawks are really beneficial because they eat, you know, eat rodents and stuff. Yeah, and you've got to follow up. You've got to have a lot of rodents to have the hawks. Yeah. Um, 
have a few, you know, one year, and, and we have these ups and downs. We had an explosion of, um, of um, rodents, um, mostly uh, netomycel voles, microtus species. And they're horrible. They, they can really decimate stuff. And um, a, a uh, bobcat settled in for the winter. It was wonderful to watch. You watch a bobcat move around. And we're in the plains and we don't have, you know, bobcat are going to, and so it was a young bobcat. It was just wonderful to watch it in the morning, this loping along, you know, they have this wonderful walk, cat, feline walk. And then we had one again this year. I should have known. We've got a terrible problem with rodents this year. Um, other farmers are seeing the same thing, but we had one hanging around for a while. I haven't seen them recently, but uh, yeah, Elgato syncola, the, 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 um, the, 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 the big cat without the tail. Um, so that's, the, you know, my staff will say, well, get Elgato syncola out there. And otherwise it's, um, it, it, and we also occasionally have pumas or you know, uh, mountain lions, whatever you call them. Um, yeah. And they'll come through cougars. They call them cougars out here. And they'll come through, um, and, and but they only move through quickly because they're chasing. Uh, they're on the heels of the elk that are moving or deer. Something um, bigger than the mice. Yeah, yeah. So occasionally staff will see them, and they don't. They don't. They don't see. You know, I would rather not run into one in the early morning. But no, don't want to run into one of those in a dark alley. You no, know, but at the same time, here they're um, they they're on the move and and they, and they have their tastes and and it's for um, it's for the young elk. Hmm. And, uh, Speaking of elk, the problem that I've got in this garden, I wonder if I could bounce a couple of ideas off of you. Is deer? Um, they are brazen and they come down into the little town where I live, off the side of the mountain here, and we'll have herds of maybe fifteen, just cruising through the town, munching down everybody's gardens. And I'm wondering, um, the one way that seems to work pretty consistently is to build a fence, and I'm going to do that for the backyard, but mm -hmm. leave the front yard completely unable to grow anything unless the deer don't like it. Um, do you have any ideas on how to deal with, with them in a humane way? In, um, in Germany... On young trees, they, they actually use wool, raw wool, and just a few threads of raw wool. And the deer get it in their throat, and it's horrible. They hate it. And, 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 and so, in, so in Germany, that's what they were doing for the deer. Um, for, so I was trained as a forester. So they, they would, and so you'd see all these, just, just a little thread. They would go, go, drop. And, and, and so if you have a source of raw wool, you might try that. And, 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 and the wonderful thing about raw wool is it's got the lanolin. Yeah. So the deer, after they, they get this in their throats and they smell it and they go, oh, we can't go near lanolin. So it's, it's, it, it, there's two factors. One is the sensory going down the touch thing in the throat. And they don't like that. And the second part is the lanolin, which is the which is the flag. Goes up. They, they're, um, I'm not going there. And so what you will do is push them out into your neighbors. But um, if you you might try that if you have a source of raw wool, and um, you don't need much. It's just a little. And uh, that's I don't have any problem with deer or elk here. Um, and, and at the moment, uh, people keep, you know, vineyards keep going in. And, but what happened here is they planted, they started planting filbert orchards, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of acres, thousands of acres in the valley. And filbert orchards, when they're about six foot high, the trees, that's like candy. It's like, you know, the, the, the elk go, Whoa, there's, <laughs> there's a beautiful, beautiful lunch counter that just opened up down there in the valley. So they started changing their patterns because they could smell the, the you know, that first flush of growth that's coming in the spring. It's full of, of sugar and stuff. 
and they can smell it a mile away. And, 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 and so we were getting groups of 100, apparently walking through the farm. I never, I never saw them, but you, know, you could see the scat. You could see where the hoof marks were. Yeah. And um, they came through very early in the morning and I'm not much of a morning person. Some farmers are, but you always assume that you want to get up at five in the morning and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a five in the morning uh, person. So, uh, so, so they, they were all up in the filbert orchards by then. Yeah. But and, and all the filbert orchard people got upset because they started getting all these uh, uh, elk in. But I, that's that's the one thing I would I would experiment with only because I love the the, the, the bisensory, <laughs> you know, ah, the, ah, the, yeah. Yeah, the taste, the smell. I, I I am very pleased with that idea of letting them take a bite out of my out of my plants in the front yard and then letting them regret it. That that sounds really good. I, I'm curious because you mentioned the the early bird uh, thing. Um, do you does your schedule with your farm keep you busy all the same keep you busy to more or less the same level all the year around or do you have a couple of really quiet months um this is somewhat slack though we continue to make deliveries we pull back a bit because it's mostly um dry stuff horseradishes you know sits in the fridge but we're not dealing with the um, uh, berries and highly perishable things. So we're making deliveries every other week. Um, the farm requires attention pretty much year round. And that's, that's deliberate on my part. I mean, I could, have, I could have set up a farm or we could have set up a farm and said, we're gonna disappear for two months. There are um, grassy farmers out here who just, you know, they, they have a house in Hawaii. And they literally just shut up the farm, go to Hawaii for a couple months and, and, and contract out some spraying of their grass seed fields and then come back for the, for the season. Um, and, and, you know, I, I knew this even before I started farming. I knew farmers like that. And it was, it's a different way. They don't have any affection or fun with their crops. Mm -hmm. And grass seed is grass seed. No, not as fun as corn. No, it's not as fun as corn. And so for me, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm inherently a plant person. I like the plant. And, you know, it's the same, you know, there are people who are animal people. I mean, I can't, I would not like to muck out stalls and be around animals. I don't like being around chickens too much. I mean, yeah, and you know, some people do, and there's a romantic notion, and there's you know the biodynamic no notion that I have to have animals as well as crops. I just don't like them. They smell. They have blood. I, I have a, a policy. They require a different kind of attention. Bye bye. <laughs> but that is a you know, and, and so every every farm it's like raising a child. It's it's the same way. It, 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 you know you. You instill in your, your child certain values that you want them to accept. Either they will or they won't. They're their own spirits. They're going to, they're going to blow you off and, on a whole bunch of stuff. And maybe they'll come back, you know. You, you sit there, no matter how much Sinatra you play for them, they may say, ah, geez, I don't, I, don't, I want Pearl Jam. And for a while, you know, I had to deal with that. Pearl Jam, what's that? <laughs> I've heard toe jam, but <laughs> oh, and then and slowly, you know, things shift. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, it's it's it, it, it's funny that way, you know. The values you have as a parent is value are the values you have as a farm. You, uh, some people, my 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 brother-in-law always wanted his children to be highly organized to make the bids and stuff. I never walked into my daughter's after about four years old. I would never have gone into her bedroom and told her what to do there. It was her world. I mean, you know, that was me philosophically. That's what I, you know, as long as I didn't smell candles, I drew the line of candles. I said, yeah, that, yeah, that's, you know, fire's no fun. But you can do other stuff. You just, no smoking, no candles. Okay, no fire. I don't want to burn down the house. And once we worked that out, you know, I never went in there, you know, if, uh, you know, 
Maybe you should take out the food that's sitting somewhere in there because I can smell it. But <laughs> you really like the smell of No, no, I'm just kidding. It's, no, but, that's... you know, how you raise it, you know, how you operate as a family, how you operate as a husband or wife, it's the same with farming. The relationship you have with the land, you're going to have, a, everybody's going to have a different relationship. And um, I remember one time we, a farmer drove by and he asked me about the weedy field alongside Rose where I was growing chicories. And to him, he's a grassy farmer. Everything's neat. The fence rows are all, I mean, he's a really good farmer. And he rents out farms all over the place. So he farms about 3,000 acres. That's, you know, you're not, it, it, that's not a, 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 you know, a Ted Mac amateur hour type farm. And uh, he looked at me and he said, yeah, what do you think about that weedy lot along side the road that I passed by? And I said, I sell it because they're chicories. But to him, my field was, deciphering my field was trying to figure out um Kanji characters in, in Japanese or or pictograms in Chinese. He he couldn't see it, and it's the same way that I joke that it's sort of like a um, uh, a a a, a, a um, who's the splasher painter. I said, you know, that's what I do Jackson on Pollock. the fields. I mean, a splash of this, a splash of that. Um, Jackson Pollock. I said, you know, my approach is a Jackson Pollock. It's 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 not it's not always neat. I mean. I like to have things all jumbled up. I like to go 10 feet and see something different. It's not, you know, it, 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 you know yeah, I, I do straight rows. I learned long ago that you're gonna, you run a cultivating tractor down a row, you want it straight. You want it really straight. Um, and I, can't, I can get an arc, I can get an arc, but it, an arc's kind of straight. I, I consider that a, a, a straight line of sorts because you can maneuver the tractor, but you don't want a wavy line. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, it, 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 it is a form of expression. And I think that when I hear people tossing around terms like biodynamic, what's a, what's a permaculture and there's a new one, um, a new term that's coming in and people keep asking me, are, do you do this, do you do that? And, um, and I, I go, take a look at the farm, just take a walk around. Um, it, it, you know, there's, there, you, I don't, you know, this, it's sort of like a painting. You've got to, it's got to be the character of the farmer. Yeah. You know, and some people the farm is all the same thing and other people, you know, I'm happy with a rather messy, I consider a rough, a rough landscape, a productive landscape. In my parlance, a rough, and that is that you have lots of sparrows, you have lots of kestrels, you have you you can flush a snipe. That to me is you know makes a day if I can flush a snipe. Um, it's a, it, you've heard enough about this about snipes. So, what about snipes? snipes yeah. yeah, snipes. Snipe. A snipe is a little dumpling, a flying dumpling. So it's a big plump little bird. And then it's got this long beak that's about six inches long, five oh, inches long. Oh, I thought, and I it thought you were talking like a snipe hunt. Like a woodcock, snipe, snipe. Okay. Um, and, and, and they're in the fields around there, common snipe. Awesome. And, they, and you see them fly away. It's a dumpling on wings. It's just this big fat thing with a, with a bill that sticks out. And you can tell them by the way, oh, that's a snipe. Yep. Like, that made my money. <laughs> Same, we have pelicans. Um, and they and and because we have a wetland, about forty acres of wetland, uh -huh. and about five years ago they changed their migration pattern. They established a new colony up in, um, up I think on Mercer Island, up somewhere up there north of us, and um, and we started. They started resting here, so we may have forty white pelicans, and you have them out there, but on on the on the, uh, you know, this is a brand new migration path for them. And they're kind of like a snipe when they fly, but they're like a huge snipe because they're, they're the largest flying bird. Yeah, they're, they're oh, and they have that, that. And then they come out and they come in and what's wonderful is to watch them drop into the wetland because it's pure chaos. And you wonder how they don't collide into each other. 
But at the very last minute, they correct the descent and they hit the spot right there. You go, holy smokes, they're gonna crash. And then boom, right into it. The smallest hole in the group and they drop right in there. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to watch. You know, you spend hours watching pelicans. That's amazing. That is so much fun watching pelicans and sparrows and snipes and playing with different seeds in the garden and making the, the garden reflect uh, your own interests and values. And are you going to have more animals or more plants or I mean, what kind of schedule do you want to keep? And reconciling the, yeah, reconciling the conflicts between you and your spouse, your partner. <laughs> yes. yes. You're trying to align lots of different values. Uh, what, what your wife likes, um, what, what you both like to eat, um, lots of personal taste. Like it's a really, it seems a very rich way to live. And, you know, uh, on a large scale, that looks like a 144 acre farm. And maybe on a smaller scale, that just looks like maintaining your home stead in the right way. I mean, just, just recently we made a, a value change. We put our TV on, on our kitchen wall instead of the front room wall. So now there's no TV in the front room and, it, it's made a, a subtle but really rewarding change to our family lifestyle. The kids watch way less movies, and it, it's been nice. Without complaining, I might add. Yeah. That's a really cool thing. I, I like that that conscious cultivation of, of multiple values, not being so pigeonholed into one that you, uh, you get consumed by it and drop all the others, but... Yeah, but really it, cool it's thing. also allowed us, you know, from a business point of view, um, to through this particularly this year, we we always had some retail, some wholesale accounts, and and having that diversity, I knew a lot of pharmacists. I can't be bothered with wholesale because you're not making the money, you know, from each widget you're getting less for. Um, and then the other people would say, I can't deal with, with retail because um, I want to sell wholesale. I want to bring in, you know, six crates of something. I don't want to go to all this little money. And I did, we did both. Um, and it, it allowed us when the restaurant said, we want to also sell retail. We want to open a farm day at our restaurant. And can you bring in beans and cornmeal and stuff for us in one pound bags? And we could do it. They knew we had it. We, they knew we were doing it. So we just brought it in, and and suddenly they could they could expand. And and instead of just being, you know, a place that had to package food, they could also say, "What well, you want? Some popcorn? You want some cayenne? You want some beans? You know, take some beans home. We're cook, cooking up the beans. But if you need beans in the middle of the week and you want to cook them yourself, there they are. The preserves, all, all the, this whole mix of things." Um, so it allowed us sort of to to, to pivot very fast, yeah. and and the relationships not being rigid. I said, okay, I'm going to charge the same price, even though it's a complete pain to sit there, bagging up you know little bags. I'm going to do that because you know things look really grim out there, and I'm not going to lose the sale because of the uh, because I'm 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 too far high and mighty to bag up little bags. You know that's. Yeah. You're being flexible and being able to go, okay, we're changing around. Um, you know, I think that's what you need to do. Or you don't have to, but um, it, it, it has really allowed us to land on our feet and, you know, and continue to enjoy this year. Yeah. Um, and suddenly, you know, people who would come out for a couple pounds and they would, they, uh, beans and, we suddenly said, okay, we're going to be offering for our, our, our retail customers to come to the farm. And we have just a, a, a select number of farm days um, before Christmas and usually about three or four before Christmas in, in the autumn. And we do our tomatoes. We also do that as a farm day. So people can come out and order tomatoes and do their own um, uh, sauce. And so they could come out and we had to do everything by pre-order. So we said, well, we're going to do, you know, we're not doing one pound bags. We're going to do two pound bags and five pound bags. And you can pre-order. You know, a lot of people were ordering, you know, 60, 70 pounds of beans because they went, yeah, you know, we want, we want to have enough beans 
and we were buying them in the store or we were going out to dinner and restaurants and stuff and we had your beans, but now we're going to get them here. And um, so, you know, making that change and, and it, it's it, oddly enough, it, 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 nobody wants to go through what we went through this year, but it was not a, an unpleasant experience. Yeah. I mean, the unpleasant experience, you know, a couple of times going into a feed store where, you know, your more conservative clientele who refuses to wear masks, you know, and they look at, you know, I remember in April, this guy said, you know, my wife's the epidemiologist for the county and she wants me to wear a mask, but I'm not wearing a mask. And he looks at me and I'm wearing a mask. And I said, well, you know, I said, you know, who's educated in the family? I mean, that's the only conclusion you can come to. I said, you, you know, she's the epidemiologist, you're the farmer. I mean, I, I, I don't know why you, why you think, you, you know, you're, you're the one that's smart about this. He looked at me and he said, growled, that was the end of it. Um, but you know, come on, you know. But other than that, you know, those little little bumps and pieces, you know, you still have people who look at you and stare at you if you go into certain places with, with a mask on. Yeah. But um, I always like to, you know, I, I, always, I always smile and say, well, you know, I, I don't have, um, uh, I don't have underlying conditions. I have undertaker conditions and I, I take this very seriously. And then they, they look and they go. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like no, I, I don't want to have this. <laughs> Undertaker conditions. I think that's you know, it, it's a bit of gallows humor, but it's it's pretty funny. That's oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's interesting. The, the one thing that I find interesting about your 2020 experience is that since you were you had some breadth, you had some diversity of values on the farm already. It made it very easy for you to, it sounds like, to pivot and to, to ramp up in one area or ramp up in another because you were already doing all these things. It wasn't like you had to start from scratch if you had to had to change over. It's not like you were growing, you know, 3,000 acres of wheat and if you had to grow something else, you had to buy new combines. You were already doing it to just scale up in a direction you were already going. And that's a cool thing. I, I think that's a very valuable lesson. Um, with that, we've actually been talking for an hour and 20 minutes, um, so we should probably round up the podcast and, and send the viewers on to look for some more of your articles and books. Um, I'm going to leave links in the description below for other things that you can find. Uh, Mr. Botard's book, Beautiful Corn, several of his articles, and a couple of videos where you made guest appearances. Uh, I believe Food Farmer Earth was one of them. Uh, yeah. That was a good one. A Farmer and His Corn, if I remember right. That was a delightful video. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. For having a little bit of humor. <laughs> Gallows or otherwise. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Me well, I mean, all forms of humor are appreciated at the Gallows. And 2020, I mean, oh, it was an interesting year. I think I one, one positive note is I, I think we're going to see more home gardening as a result of last year. Uh, just because oh. of... Oh yeah, you know yeah. the farmers are all skittish because we, we, we you know, last year um, the the seed just disappeared. So fortunately, we grow most of our own seed. Okay. But, um, in the seed catalogs, yeah, they were, and that and and then the mason jar lids. I still haven't seen them in the stores yet. Um, so at least around here, the mason jar lids all disappeared. Fortunately, we had a healthy supplies I could do by our tomato sauce. But. Yes, the difference between hoarding and stockpiling is whether you did it before or during the emergency. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Preferably before. Preferably long before. Gosh, well, thank you for the conversation. I'll, I'll follow up later with you with uh, a couple of emails, let you know how it goes growing this uh, winter rind melon. I'm really, really excited about that one. And yeah. thank you. Have a have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you, Joe. Good have a good one. Bye. Okay, leave. Boom. Go. Yep, I'm clicking the button. There it goes. Thanks again. We've survived. <laughs> yes. <laughs>